Nearly 2 million visitors will come to Logan Pass during the short two to three month summer season. This shuttle stop is literally the high point of the going to the Sun Road as well as the high point of many visits to the park. The pass sits along the Continental Divide 6,646 feet and treats visitors to sweeping views of mountains and subalpine meadows full of colorful wildflowers. The rangers at the Logan Pass Visitor Center can assist with answers to questions about the area and information on plants, wildlife, and hikes. A bookstore is also located in the Visitor Center. From the back of the Visitor Center, a boardwalk crossing flower-filled meadows leads to Hidden Lake Overlook. This one and a half mile walk provides visitors with dramatic views of Mount Reynolds, Clements Mountain, and sparkling Hidden Lake. Hikers can continue another mile and a half down a steep trail to the lake where Bear Hat Mountain rises above on the far side. Please remain on the boardwalk and trail. A careless human step will leave a huge impact to plants in this fragile environment. Across from the visitor center, on the other side of the Going to the Sun Road, visitors can experience one of Glacier's most popular hikes, the Highline Trail. Although there are a few precipitous spots on the trail, don't let that discourage you from enjoying some of the most spectacular views in the park. Here in Glacier National Park, we are fortunate to be surrounded by such amazing wildlife. And if you happen to have the opportunity to see wildlife, especially while hiking on a trail, make sure to give them the right of way. And also, remember never to feed wildlife in the park. We want to keep our wildlife wild. The more that animals think that we're a source of food, the more chance that we might see them acting aggressively towards us. So to keep us safe and to keep the animals safe, it's important that you remember never to feed animals when you're in the national park. Located on a prominent bend on the Going to the Sun Road, Sai Bend Shuttle Stop marks the transition point between higher elevation subalpine vegetation and the forest of the east side. Mount Sai towers over the area with Going to the Sun Mountain to the right and Cataract and Pegan Mountains to the left. Two popular day hikes depart from this location, Pegan Pass and Sai Pass. A portion of the trail over Pegan Pass to Mini Glacier is visible from the road. This long 12.8 mile but rewarding hike passes through many ecological communities and has fantastic panoramic views, including spectacular mountain summits and Pegan Glacier. The 10.3 mile Sai Pass carpeted trail Preston climb. Park to the rugged saddle of Sai Pass. With views across the St. Mary Valley, as well as peaks south along the Continental Divide, the descent into the valley of Bering Creek begins with views of Sexton Glacier and winds through grassy slopes and stands of Douglas fir. The trail ends at Sundrift Gorge and another shuttle stop. While hard to appreciate standing next to the Going to the Sun Road today, this area presented a real challenge to the builders of the road. A massive amount of material was required to support the road and bridge the gulf between Pegan and Going to the Sun Mountains. Far beneath the fill, a 10 foot by 10 foot culvert accented by masonry work and a 16 foot headwall channels Sai Creek under the road. The East Side Tunnel was one of the most difficult challenges on the entire Going to the Sun Road. Built in 1931, the 408 foot tunnel appears to come directly out of Pegan Mountain with waterfalls cascading down the portal. Before work could begin, a three and a half mile trail was constructed 200 feet above the road from Logan Pass to a point above the site of the tunnel. A platform on which to work was excavated by moving 6,250 cubic yards of dirt and rock. The materials and equipment were hauled to the platform above the tunnel site and then were packed by laborers down ladders and switchbacks totaling 200 vertical feet. In November of 2006, Severe rain and flooding washed out multiple sections of both lanes on the Going to the Sun Road near the tunnel. Within days, heavy snows prevented access and repairs had to wait until spring road crews could plow their way to the damaged sites. I'm standing here on the Going to the Sun Road on the east side below the east tunnel where most of the, uh, the worst damage occurred following that November 2006 storm. Right behind me here, you can see the ravine that uh, carried all the water and debris that took out a lane and three quarters of this site. 
Several strategies were explored for repairs, and eventually it was decided that a mechanically stabilized earthen wall, 350 feet long, would solve one problem, and a temporary bridge would be required to provide two-way traffic over another spot. This incident is a reminder of the power of nature and reiterates the need to rehabilitate the Going to the Sun Road so that future generations can enjoy its majesty. As you drive through the West Tunnel, imagine the time and manpower it took to bore through 192 feet of mountain using 1926 technology. Dynamite and jackhammers were used by men working double and triple shifts tackling this monumental task in October of 1926. Finally, winter temperatures of 32 degrees below zero forced workers to stop working and come back in April of 1927 to finish the job. Two interesting and impressive features of the tunnel are the observational windows that were created to offer spectacular views of Heaven's Peak and the upper McDonald Creek Valley. A sidewalk lines the tunnel and allows access to the window ports within. Please use extra caution as you walk inside the tunnel as drivers and vehicles may not be able to see well in the reduced light inside the tunnel. As originally constructed, the tunnel was unlined and over time seeping water started to weaken the roof and bits of rock would occasionally fall onto the roadbed and passing vehicles. Its current smooth inner lining was installed to prevent damage to passing cars and to help stabilize the roof. From this spot, visitors often mistake the series of cascades on Haystack Creek directly in front of them for Bird Woman Falls. But Bird Woman Falls is actually the 492-foot drop Oberlin on the left the and Mount Cannon on the right. Notice the broad U-shaped bowl above the waterfall and look down the valley to the right and notice the same broad U-shape. Both features are the results of glaciers. I'm Dan Fagu of the U.S. Geological Survey's Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center. I've been a research ecologist here at Glacier National Park for the past 21 years. Bird Woman Falls is a classic example of a glacially sculpted landscape. Uh, this area has been under a lot of pressure in the last glaciation that ended about 12,000 years ago and lasted for hundreds of thousands of years. And this has allowed the landscape to be molded by the ice through time. The main trunk of the glacier sculpted out the area below Logan Pass and swept down around and actually scooped out Lake McDonald. The side valley there uh, didn't have as much cutting power because the ice in there was not as massive and so it couldn't cut down as fast as the main valley floor and so it lagged behind and therefore when all the ice melted it was suspended and we call that a hanging valley and that's what Bird Woman Falls drains out of. Surrounded by carpets of wildflowers during the summer, Lunch Creek flows down a natural rock staircase from the striking backdrop of Pollock Mountain. It was named for its popularity as a lunch stop for early visitors to the park and remains a popular stop on the road today. No formal trails exist here, so please enjoy the area from the paved parking. Over time, park visitors have continued to venture off the road and up the creek exploring the area and in the process have created a network of social trails in this sensitive and fragile habitat. In order to protect the area from curious feet, Glacier National Park staff have performed extensive revegetation to rehabilitate Lunch Creek and eliminate the traces of trails by replanting native vegetation. Please notice the signs marking these rehabilitated areas and do not venture into them. If you are interested in the process of revegetation, plan on visiting the park's native plant nursery at headquarters in West Glacier. All the native plant materials are collected here in the park for the most part, and then we do seed collection as well as cuttings, and then um, grow those over usually about a three year period of time, and then we outplant them in the specific area where that they are needed. Any place where we have human-caused disturbance, we try to minimize that disturbance by um, putting in native plant materials. The public are welcome to come visit. We have a volunteer Tuesday, every Tuesday starting usually about mid-June through the last week of August. And from nine to four o'clock on Tuesdays, people can just walk in. They can come in, just look around. They can come in and work for an hour. They can come in and work for the whole day. There is a guided tour also on Tuesdays 
Tuesdays, just to make it simple, people can associate Tuesdays with uh, the native plant nursery and that starts over in the front of headquarters. We definitely encourage the public to come and visit us and see what we're about.